Would it not be wonderful if every person in the world could have a song like that in his heart? But not everybody can sing, there's within my heart a melody. We live in a world that is filled with so much negativity and pessimism. And I don't have to tell you that this morning, you know that it's true. And in a recent poll, I saw where the vast majority of Americans believe that the country is headed in the wrong direction. And what concerns me is I'm not sure many of our citizens would know the right direction. Because Jeremiah 10, 23 says, It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Man needs help from above to know the right direction. This year is rather interesting because we've also learned that the two candidates seeking the presidency are the two most negative candidates ever. That is, most people view them in a negative light, and one will be elected. Here's something else to consider, <laughs> that most people are being directed toward particular candidates out of fear of the other one being elected. Well, we live in a negative world. And I will say this, if there is going to be anyone out there who is going to be positive and optimistic, surely it's a Christian. Surely it's a Christian. We need Christian people who show a better way of living than what our world knows and understands. I love this passage that you find on the screen today. It has been a favorite of mine for a long, long time. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It is a passage found in Psalm 34, 8. Now know this about our Lord. He never, ever sought to in some way disguise his truth. He always was very open with others. He challenged people to test the accuracy of the claims he made to see if his promises really were true. Perhaps you remember an account of our Lord Jesus as recorded in John 20. It is a post-resurrection scene. Jesus had appeared to his disciples on one particular first day of the week, and then another first day of the week, he appears again. Now, the first time he appears to his disciples in a particular room on the first day of the week, we would note that there's a disciple who's missing. His name is Thomas. He's not yet witnessed the risen Christ, and he doesn't believe his fellow disciples that they've really seen him. In fact, he says, unless I can see those nail prints and see where he was pierced in his side, I will not believe. And so he appears to be a very negative person. But he is in the midst of the disciples the following week, and Jesus again appears. And Jesus does not scold Thomas, but really he lets him just examine the evidence, doesn't he? Here is Jesus. You see the nail-pierced hands. Here's the scar in my side. And Thomas was convinced, my Lord and my God. Thomas saw the evidence that indeed Christ had risen from the dead. And it changed his world from one of negativity to one of great optimism. Jesus is alive. Jesus has risen from the dead. Now, I don't know of anyone who ever rejected Jesus and was happy about it. Do you? There is a rich young ruler who came to Jesus with a very important question, that question that all of us need to ask and find the answer. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And not only did he ask the right question, he came to the right source, didn't he? Because Jesus is the one that could tell him. But when Jesus challenged him, about something he had to give up. 
the rich young ruler turned away, and the text says, when he did so, he went away sorrowfully. Judas Iscariot, for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. Did that satisfy him? No. A little later, he took that money and he threw it down at the co-conspirator's feet and went out and took his life. Didn't make him happy. And yet of those we read about in our Bibles who followed the Lord, they never regretted it. Those who followed him continually and didn't give up never regretted it. They were, were satisfied with the choice they made and they didn't turn their backs on Jesus. And even if it meant dying a martyr's death, they died rejoicing. And so I want to challenge all of us here today in the midst of so much negativity in our world, I, I want to challenge us to look on the sunny side of life. It's still there, okay? You can still find it. And I hope I can point you in that direction this morning. I, I want us to, to look on the sunny side, and that is be a bright, optimistic, happy people. Can we do that? Many, many years ago in the early days of country music, there was a family of singers called the Carters. And some are in this audience that perhaps know who I'm talking about, but many of you will not. But the Carter family and the matriarch of that clan was called Mother Maybell. And she had several daughters who sang with her. Now, they were marvelously talented. They could play a variety of instruments. And they also could sing. Now, you might listen to them today and think, no, they couldn't sing. But they were considered very fine singers back in their day. And one of the daughters of Mother Maybell, her name was June, June Carter. And she later married one of the most noted country music artists, Johnny Cash. But they sang a song that became popular during its time called Keep on the Sunny Side. Keep on the Sunny Side of Life. It was very popular, at least for country music during that particular time, either sing songs about shared maladies that everybody faced, and that allowed you to know that uh, there are other people out there who are miserable too. <laughs> We're all in this together. Or to sing positive, uplifting songs of how in the midst of trial you stay on the sunny side. Now, that genre of music is not as popular anymore, but the message contained in those lyrics, like keep on the sunny side, still good. Keep on the sunny side of life. I very much believe our Lord intends for us to live on the bright side of life. And I hope that in this message, during the next few minutes, I can explain why I believe that to be true. If we're going to stay on the sunny side, then we're going to have to deal with some things very effectively in our minds. And our Lord Jesus appeals to us through His Word, and that Word appeals to our minds. And when we get the Word of God in us, it'll help us to change our thought patterns. Whereas perhaps they have been negative, they will become positive. Where they have been pessimistic, they become optimistic. Think of this particular passage in Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now note that Paul did not say that rejoicing comes through our circumstances because circumstances are not always what we like. But rather he says despite the circumstances, rejoice in the Lord. Hebrews 12, 2 informs us that our Lord Jesus Christ could even find joy in that agonizing death on the cross. How could that be? Because even while our Lord was suffering through that awful trial and through Calvary's cross, He was able to look ahead and see Himself seated in glory and thinking about what He could do on behalf of every one of us. He, he, he had joy in His cross because He knew what that cross could accomplish. In 1 Peter 4, 14, we're encouraged by the Apostle Peter 
to be a happy group of people. And that's not always easy, is it? But listen to what Peter says. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. Why, Peter? Peter can answer because Peter's known reproach. He says, for the, spirit of, uh, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth on you. On their part, he's evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And so if you're, you're, you're being reproached for Christ, look on the bright side. The Lord says you're one of his. What a joy it is that if you're going to have to suffer, to suffer as a Christian, he would say. Because we know our Lord recognizes our sufferings and will bring relief to us. You see, your perspective on life totally changes when you're found in Jesus. And one who is so negative about life becomes positive about life. Because of the relationship he has with his Lord. In Romans chapter 12, here again we're mindful of how important it is to bring the mind in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul again is the writer. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world. You could also insert there for the word world, culture or society. Be not conformed to the culture around you but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If we're going to be a positive thinking people, then we're going to have to make some, some changes in the way we think. We're going to have to understand that until our mind is brought into submission to the will of Christ, then we really cannot be a joyful people. And so the Bible encourages us, don't be negative, don't be pessimistic. And yet when we think about that and we express agreement with that, it also calls upon us to, to do some introspection, to look inside, doesn't it? I sometimes like to challenge us to take the inner part of ourselves out and just get a good look at it. Maybe you'll like what you see. Maybe you will not. Now what you've got to do is examine yourself in light of the Word of God. Perhaps some of us here this morning, good people who love the Lord, might be surprised at how hypercritical we are. I don't know. Maybe if we really examined ourselves, we might come to this conclusion. You know, I'm critical of something all of the time. We also might could look on the inside and determine, you know, I'm a cynical person. I don't believe anything good that's ever stated. There is a very common word out there in this generation, and this is it. Whatever. <laughs> right. Somebody will say something, you can't believe it's true, and you just say, whatever. That's a word of cynicism, isn't it? So we don't want to be hypercritical. We don't want to be cynical all the time. Some are filled with contempt toward others, and that's not good. Let someone else be praised, and do you become envious over that person? And think, well, look what I've done. Nobody's recognized what I've tried to do for others. Do you ever think that your good deeds are overlooked? I guess we all do at times. And we need to remember for whose glory are these good deeds, correct? Jesus went into an upper room and he washed his disciples' feet. He did a good work. He was the prince of glory. Someone should have washed his feet. But remember that Jesus is the only one who left that room that night whose feet were not washed. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. They didn't wash his. And the scriptures do not even record that there was a thank you given. But you see, Jesus came 
to serve. Notice for just a few minutes this morning some examples of those who might not have realized just how critical, how cynical or contemptuous they could be. Let's look at this example in Luke chapter 7. Do you remember that Jesus came into the home of one who was a Pharisee and his name was Simon? And this particular man was, was not one who was filled with hatred toward Jesus. I don't believe that. Not like many Pharisees were filled with hatred toward Jesus. But this man was skeptical of Jesus. He was curious about him. He says, I'm going to bring him into my home. And yet we learn from this narrative that the man really didn't treat Jesus politely. Again, he, he, he brought him into his home, but he didn't treat him like a typical guest ought to be treated. And then there is a woman who obviously has been forgiven by her Lord who courageously comes into this room filled with Pharisees, filled with men who would look on any woman coming into their presence in the way she did in a contemptuous way. How dare she? Come into this gathering and instead of serving us, she goes over to Jesus and she begins to express her love for him. She's weeping, verse 38. She's washing his feet with her tears. She wipes them with the hairs of her head, kisses his feet, and anoints them with ointment. And this Simon the Pharisee didn't say anything, but it's what he was thinking. If this one is who he claims to be, then he would have known who this woman, who this woman was that came into this room. He would know what type of person she is. And in his mind, he is coming to the conclusion that this really is not a great prophet, and it certainly isn't the Christ. But Jesus knew the man's thoughts and exposed them. He was a contemptuous being. What about in Matthew 19? You remember the disciples of Jesus? They were so protective of their Lord some parents are bringing children to Jesus, and what do the disciples want to do? Get them out of the way. Critical of the parents for bringing them. Jesus corrected those disciples. These little children are like what I want to see in the hearts of the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Let these children come to me. And then we consider Luke, the 10th chapter, and we would also note how Jesus had to correct the thinking of others, including some of his closest friends he must correct. For example, Martha was a close friend of Jesus, good woman, wanted to provide a marvelous meal for Jesus, but she's concerned, overly concerned, about matters that aren't that important, like preparing a meal instead of listening to Jesus. Martha probably did not realize what she was doing wrong on this occasion. By charging her sister with not helping her, what was she doing? Trying to take her away from that which was most important, listening at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried over things that really don't matter. We'll enjoy that meal soon enough, but right now, Mary's chosen what's best, and I can't take that away from her. Do you really want to see some hearts that were close to Jesus that still were not filled with the Spirit of Jesus? Then notice in Luke chapter 9, the previous chapter from this, verses 54 and 55. You remember that in Samaria, they didn't receive Jesus. And they didn't receive him because they knew where he was going toward Jerusalem and they had no association with those like Jesus and his disciples. And when his disciples and James saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou, thou, thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? And Jesus turned to them and rebuked them. Ye know not what manner of spirit you are, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives but to save them. These are the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. Lord, we'll take care of them, right? 
Let's just bring down fire from heaven. Such contempt for these people who did indeed turn their backs on Jesus, but Jesus still loved them and wanted to be kind toward them. For you see, he was going to Jerusalem to die. And when he dies on the cross in Jerusalem, it will likewise be for those who turn their backs upon him. What I'm saying is, through these examples we've just noticed in the gospel records, we have seen negative people. And our Lord was around some of these people. And I want to tell you, we have to be careful because we can easily surround ourselves with negative people. And I want to tell you, it can be catching, <laughs> right? You don't want to catch negativity and pessimism, but it will. It will take hold of you if you continually surround yourself by all the negativity and the pessimism that's in our world. Now, one of my favorite character studies in the Bible is a man named Caleb. Over the last uh, generation or so, a lot of boys have been named Caleb. And that's a good name for parents to name their sons. You remember that according to Numbers 13, the children of Israel uh, learned from a group of spies who Moses had sent out to spy out the land that it was indeed a prosperous land and Israel could do well in the land of promise. But there's a problem. There are giants in the land. There are fortified cities. It's going to be hard to go in there and take over this land. We're just not able to do it. That's negativism, isn't it? God's supposed to be on your side, and yet you don't think you can do what he's told you to do. Caleb, on the other hand, says, we are well able to take this land. Who is this man, Caleb? I'll tell you this. He's positive, isn't he? He is an optimistic man. He says, I know with God's help we can do it. Sounds like what those of us who used to sit in the classes of the beloved Richard Curry would hear. God plus one's a majority. You're on God's side. You can win. You can be victorious. But I'll tell you this, dear friend, negativism and pessimism will ruin lives. Oh, it will bring homes crumbling down. It can destroy churches. Negativism and pessimism are harmful, and one can never reach his potential in the Lord Jesus Christ if he's overwhelmed with negativism and pessimism. Now, this idea of positive thinking does have some negative connotations in our society today because there are some well-known preachers who have given positive thinking a bad name. It started with men like Norman Vincent Peale back in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s. He was followed by disciples of his like Robert Schuller, Crystal Cathedral out in California. Kenneth Copeland was another one of these uh, promoters of positive thinking. And in our modern era, two that are well known today, would have to be Joel Osteen and Creflo Dollar. And what they do is they teach a message of, of, uh, of prosperity, fiscal financial prosperity, if you're a Christian. And that is, you send your money to us, and we'll pray over it, and we can guarantee that you're going to be blessed. And the only ones really being blessed financially Joel Osteen and Creflo Dollar <laughs> because they're, they're able to be able to talk in a way that deceives the most naive and gullible among us. And so their idea is that if you uh, will give your money to our ministry, then we can guarantee you as we pray over it, you're going to be blessed financially and everything is going to go right in your life. That's a deceptive theology, isn't it? It denies reality. And what is reality? That in this world we live, bad things happen. And they oftentimes happen to Christian people. In fact, Jesus makes it clear to us that some of the difficulties and trials we're going to face in life will come as a direct result of us being Christians. So that's a false theology. 
When I speak of biblically thinking positive, I am not talking about denying what is reality. But I am saying this, as Christians, we have examined things in our minds, having studied the Word of God, our perspective has now changed, and we really do believe what God said through Paul, all things work together for good to them that love God. To those who are called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28. Things in our lives might not always be good. Bad things happen. But we have God's promise that everything's going to be all right. Everything is going to work out all right. As long as we align ourselves with Him and live within the confines of His Word. That is a positive, optimistic message. Let's notice it for just a moment from the life of the Apostle Paul as we notice in Philippians chapter 4, that passage again, where he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That stands out in the book of Philippians because it really is a book of joy. Now somebody says, all right, I've read the passage, but, but Brother Grider, isn't it true that when Paul wrote that he was in prison? That's correct. And yet this man Paul finds a reason to rejoice even in prison, perhaps even in solitary confinement. That is correct. He did. Notice what brought real joy to the Apostle Paul. First of all, in verse 6 of chapter 1, he has, he has an amazing confidence. He says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Here in prison, he says, I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about the church at Philippi and all the ways that God's going to bless you. And he says, I can even find a positive reason for being here in this prison. It's verse 12. He said, I would ye understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. Because of what's happened to me in prison, there are more people speaking up than ever before on behalf of Christ. Because I'm here in prison, there are souls that are being saved that would not have been saved otherwise. Do you see how his perspective is different from others? Do you see how he can say, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice? And then it seems in Philippians 1 that the, the chapter reaches a crescendo in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now Paul says everything that I do, it surrounds the Lord Jesus Christ. That is one of the most positive statements that can be found anywhere in the Bible. And not only that, according to chapter 3 verse 14, he says I'm no longer looking behind. I look forward constantly. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, he would conclude this chapter by stating in verse 13 of Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You need a boost? You've been thinking negatively? Go back and read the book of Philippians again. And let Paul's words warm your heart. As he writes through divine inspiration from prison, biblical positive thinking changes our lives. Why? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. And so we've got to change the mind, which changes the heart. Negativism says something about the heart of man. What is it that happens when you habitually pump out depressing, dark, negative thoughts into your world? It brings destruction, doesn't it? It brings destruction. Your home, other people that live in your home find it miserable to be there with you. In the church, you're difficult to get along with. Friends, if you once had them, probably going to start avoiding you because you have chosen this particular disposition. But when you live on the sunny side of life, what are you doing? You're thinking constructive thoughts. And you're pumping these constructive thoughts out into the world around you. And as a result, positive action, positive results start coming your way. Now let me ask you this, dear friends. What are you negative about today? I know it's something. For every one of us, we, we know 
we could say there's something I'm negative about today. Let me ask all of us this question. Is that particular problem that's caused you to be negative bigger than God? Now remember what uh, Peter reminds us, admonishes us to do. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Are you worried about something and yet you say, well, it's not big enough to take to God? Then let me tell you something. It's not big enough to worry about. If there's something in your life not big enough to take to God, it's not big enough for you to worry about. Casting all your care upon him, he careth for you. Listen to the philosophy of the Roman Marcus Aurelius. Life is what our thoughts make it. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great American essayist and poet, said, A man is what he thinks about all day long. William James, the father of American psychiatry, The greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. The well-known public speaker, Zig Ziglar, attitude, not aptitude, determines one's altitude. Now take all of that and listen to what the inspired writer Paul said. You want to be happy? You want to be positive? Here's Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Didn't Paul say at an earlier time, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus? Let this mind be in you. And Philippians 4, 8, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, that's the mind of Jesus. That's what he thinks about. And so, my friends, not only will will thinking positive thoughts make you more like Jesus, it's going to change the world around you. It really will. Those be happy attitudes, as we sometimes call them, in Matthew chapter 5, are followed by this message from Jesus. You be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. When you learn to have those beatitudes of Christ living within you, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. You see, this is biblical positive thinking. I know there is such a thing as sin. You hear me preach about that. But I also know there's such a thing as salvation. I know there's such a thing as hatred. But I also know there's love. I know there is such a thing as sorrow, but I also know there is such a thing as joy. I know there is some things that are wrong, but there are also some things that are right. I know there is something called error, but I also know there's something called truth. I know there is a place called hell, but I also know there's a place called heaven. I know there really is a devil. But I also know there's Jesus. Therefore, despite the negativity that's in our world, I as a Christian can have the proper perspective that's biblical. And that is I can be positive and I can be optimistic about the future. Why? Because my Lord Jesus Christ is positive and optimistic and he's in control of it. He's in control of it. When you come to Him in His appointed way, you come to the light. And therefore, you can always be singing, keep on the sunny side, right? Because when you come to Him, you come to the light. It is a bright and glorious October morning outside. But I don't tell you, you can be brighter and glorious if you'll come to Jesus this morning in the way that He has told us to come to Him through His Word Just believe in in Him and His message. Believe it. Put your faith in Him. Repent of your past. You can do that. Just change your mind. You can change your life by changing your mind. Confess Him as the Son of God. Be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. 
you can leave here today, I'm going to tell you, on the sunny side. Sunny side. Living in the brightness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that how you're living today? Think about that and respond accordingly as together we stand and sing.